All right. How's everybody doing this morning? It's a little mellow. Everybody enjoyed just sitting through the music today. I saw you stand up for a little bit there, so that's good. That's very good. Well, it's good to have everybody here. Uh, my name is Ryan. As John said, I'm the lead pastor here, and I have the privilege of following him, our founding pastor. So it's good to have John here today, isn't it? Yeah. It was a, it was a far louder clap than what you gave. Just kidding. So it's good to see everybody. Uh, as he said, we're launching a brand new series today uh, on gratitude, and we're going to be exploring the power of gratitude. Do you remember as a kid, uh, and maybe, maybe even as an adult, if you have a spouse, a significant other, and you were in a scenario and you forgot to say thank you, and you got the like, little love tap, say thank you. Right? I remember as we tell our kids as they grow up, you've got to say thank you, you've got to say thank you. Right? A lot of times we don't say thank you uh, just because we get caught off guard. We get caught by surprise. Right? I think that's a lot of the reason why we don't show gratitude, why our kids can get so excited about a moment that they forget to say thank you, or we can get so excited by what's happening, we say thank you. Now, surprise is an interesting word, right? Because uh, how many of you all raise your hand nice and high, you've experienced good surprises? Good surprises. Good, wonderful. Some, some of you haven't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish, maybe, maybe today will be different. Uh, maybe we'll end early today, and then everybody will get a good surprise. Um, but don't hold your breath. Uh, how many of you, though, you've experienced a, what we'll say maybe is a negative surprise, right? It kind of takes your breath away. You weren't expecting it. It was the news from the doctor. It was the news from a, a, a job. It was it's something that you just, it hit you, and it was a surprise. And it's interesting, because in those moments, we oftentimes forget to express gratitude as well, because we become overwhelmed. And it's not that, not that we're meant to express gratitude for the negative surprise, but in it, right? And so I want to say right off the bat, as we start to talk about gratitude, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, that it's important we know right from the beginning that I, uh, as a human being, as a follower of Jesus, as a peacemaker, I'm not a, a person who believes that, that that means I have to be grateful for everything that happens to me. I just don't, that's not my kind of framework for life. Now, some people uh, live in that framework, and that's a belief system, and you might be in the room, and that's fine. I'm not here to argue with you or anything like that, but you should just know from the beginning that I, I think to be a grateful person, to have gratitude in our lives, doesn't mean that I have to believe that everything that happens to me is a part of some cosmic plan, that everything that happens in the world is a part of a cosmic plan, because there's a lot of evil, horrible, terrible things that I don't think have anything to do with God's plan, God's will, love love's plan, love's work in our world. And so I don't, I'm not thankful for that. Uh, and I don't kind of live in that space where I say, well, you know what? That's just, God's, God's got a plan for that. That's why God allowed that or God did that. I think that produces somewhat of a frightening image of God considering the evil that happens in our world. So let me just throw that out there. So in case you're sitting here and you're nervous that this is a, a three-week series on why you have to be grateful for all the bad stuff that happens in your life, just exhale. Whew. That's not going to happen, Okay. But I do think gratitude is far more than just being polite, right? And I do think that gratitude is far more than trying to trick our mind into saying that something bad that we've experienced is something good. I actually think that gratitude is transformative, that gratitude can actually transform us from the inside out. The gratitude offers us a type of, we'll, we'll use the word in church world, salvation. Salvation from the pain of our circumstances, salvation from rejection, salvation from lies that produce pain and produce evil in our world. And so I want to take a few minutes today and just explore a few verses out of the Gospel of Luke uh, and ask the question, what wisdom can we find there around this idea of gratitude? I'm going to look at eight verses in Luke, and uh, I'm going to give you two extra bonus ones later. So we're going to look at Luke 17, 11 through 19, but then I'm going to sneak in 20 and 21. And I'm going to sneak in chapter 9, verse 51, and a few there, and then maybe one from 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> but I promise we won't be here very long, all right? No. Now, if I said all of that and you're a guest, this is your first time around church, you're thinking to yourself, where are the exits? There were three. I know when I walked in this room, I caught sight of the two main exits outside of the atrium because when I came in here, I didn't know how long I was going to stay. I want you to relax. No, no prerequisite knowledge around the Bible here. I promise not to use the Bible uh, to manipulate you, to control you, to tell you how to live your life. We look at Scripture around here as a book of wisdom that's meant to help us and give us an opportunity to learn how, what it means to follow Jesus and to look at people who tried to 
live a faithful life, who try to discern the work of God in their time. But the Bible is uh, from a long time ago in a land far away. And so we take that very seriously around here. And we know that sometimes scripture, uh, in oftentimes mel- well-meaning ways, has been weaponized. And so it's our heartbeat here at Crossroads that, that the scriptures are a place of life. And the world, it's okay to question. It's okay to ask really tough questions of the Bible. And we should take the Bible very seriously. Um, so we're going to look at Luke. Luke is what we call a gospel. If you're new to Bible study or new to just interacting with Scripture, the word gospel means good news. We have one gospel and what we say four according tos. So there's one good news that Jesus brought. There's one message that Jesus came teaching and proclaiming. And we have four versions of that in our Bible, in our Christian Bible. So we have an according to by Matthew, we say, according to by Mark, according to by Luke, and according to by John. And they're all very unique, and they're different, and they're wonderful, and they give us different perspectives. So I want to look at the gospel according to Luke. And remember, these are theological documents. They're meant to help us understand uh, how Luke, the writer, understood Jesus, how he took sources that Luke had. Luke didn't sit down and pray real hard and fast and then just kind of close his eyes and, and say, okay, go ahead and write. And then, then God animated his hand and he just wrote everything in perfect English for us, right? No, like Luke had sources that were handed to him, right? Luke had uh, whole books potentially, like the scholarship tells us that Luke probably had a pretty close version of Mark that we have that he used. And Matthew and Luke had another source that they shared. And, and Luke shapes these stories to help us understand what he thought was important about Jesus and the gospel. And it actually Luke carries into another book we have in the New Testament called Acts. So we're going to look at the gospel of Luke. Uh, one of the big themes in the gospel of Luke is that the gospel message of Jesus was for everybody was for everybody, that it wasn't bound to one group of people, particularly the Jews. So, so that's a big theme for Luke and Acts. Luke Acts is actually the story of how the message of Jesus goes from Jerusalem to Rome. That's the whole big story there. So I want to look at Luke chapter 17, and uh, we find Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, about eight chapters earlier or so, Jesus is said to have kind of said, hey, you know what? It's time to go to Jerusalem for his suffering, for his passion. And, uh, and they begin this journey south from Galilee into Jerusalem where the temple was. And so it says that on the way to Jerusalem, he happened to pass between Samaria and Galilee. Now that's an important thing because this is less about geography and like timing, more about theology for Luke. So he wants us to know that this story takes place, Jesus is in the land in between, Right? So Samaria was an area that the Samaritans lived in, and the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. And so this was the space between. It was a space, honestly, where pain would gather because it was outside of the city. It was outside of any in particular region. And so you might find like a, a, a mixing of ethnicities between the Samaritans and the Jewish people that you wouldn't have normally. And so that's going to happen here. Things that would happen outside the city, you would have colonies of people who might be considered unclean. Maybe they were sick, of, and it's for some reason they couldn't be a part of their village, a part of their culture, so they lived outside the city, and they, were, uh, they would have been reduced to begging along these roads. You would oftentimes find bandits along the road. It was an unsafe journey in a sense. And Jesus is kind of hanging out in this area, and, uh, and as he's traveling on, he's on his way to Jerusalem, we find in Luke chapter 9 that this is, this is an interesting journey. He has set his face towards Jerusalem, and he had been in Samaria, but he had been rejected in Samaria. So he wanted to go, and he wanted to set up, uh, kind of shop for a little bit, and, and he wanted to do some ministry in this region of Samaria. But it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, that it happened in those days that Jesus knew he was going to be taken up, and so he sent messengers on ahead of him, is what it says. And they entered a Samaritan village to get ready for him, right? So he he was the advanced team, right? There was an advanced team that went down for Jesus, right? We got to find a place for him to, to set up camp, to do some ministry, to share, to teach, to talk about the kingdom of God. But the Samaritans, it says, wouldn't welcome him. They wouldn't welcome him because he had made up his mind to go to Jerusalem, So he had said, I'm going to Jerusalem. And for a Samaritan, this was a huge mistake. 
This was one of the biggest mistakes any person could ever make. So a Samaritan would have been a person whose real, their total identity in this time frame, their religious identity, their ethnic identity, would be focused on this very simple conviction that the Samaritan people had the authentic revelation, they knew exactly what the tradition was, to bear the ancient Hebrews' religion. And they worshipped at a place called Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And they believed deeply that this was the divine place that you were to worship the God of Israel, Yahweh. It was not in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem temple was a fraud. And really anybody on pilgrimage through their area to Jerusalem was sadly misguided. They were a heretic. They were in the process of making what a Samaritan would think would be the biggest mistake thinking that Yahweh, their God, the God of the Hebrews, wanted to be worshipped in Jerusalem. And so not offering hospitality, in a sense, was a way of saying, we're not going to participate in your heresy. We're not going to help you make a huge mistake. And it produced all kinds of animosity. So Jesus had come through, and by the way, when the Samaritans rejected, a couple of Jesus' disciples were like, do you want us to call fire down on them? (laughs) Jesus was like, no. (laughs) That's all he said. He's like, no. Oh, yeah, I'm sure there was something like that too along the way, right? So as it says in Luke, as he was coming into this village, right? So he's coming out of Samaritan. There's, there's these villages. He's met by 10 lepers. So we know there's a leper colony. Now, uh, leprosy is, this, is different than what we think of leprosy. It was a skin disease. Uh, anytime there was a skin disease, somebody had a mark on their skin, they'd have to go to the priest. The priest would declare them clean or unclean. If they were unclean, they were gone. They were ousted. Out of the city, out of, you don't spread that. It was a, it was a, you know, it was like a mask mandate. (laughs) See, it could be worse, right? I mean, they were like out of community. You couldn't be in the town. You had to stay far away from people. You had to shout things like unclean. Sometimes they would wear bells, right? It was just, they were, they were marked, right? And so they're off in a distance, as you would expect, and they shout, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. So there's these 10 lepers in a leper colony. They're shouting for Jesus. They, they recognize that Jesus has some measure of authority, according to Luke. And they're saying, have mercy on us. They're crying out for mercy. And I just want to pause and say, I think there's something really powerful about what Luke has shown us. Like Luke has shown us that Jesus was in the margin. Like Jesus was in this space between acceptance and rejection. Jesus was in this space of loneliness. Jesus was in this space where you didn't belong. And here's what I think, like when when you're in that space, when you're in the margins of society, there's always a cry. And that cry, I believe still to this day, is always mercy. The society itself has set up the system that pushes people to the margins. And in the margins is the cry from the powerless. In the margins is the cry from those who don't have any place to go or turn to, and they're saying, mercy, mercy. Mercy from this system, mercy from this way that has, has ousted us, that can't care for us, that doesn't know what to do with us. See, in the margins, mercy is like water in a desert. It's just desperately needed. And that's where Jesus was in this moment. And he sees them, right? And he says to them, go show yourselves to the priests. Go show yourselves to the priests. And I just have to wonder, like, the 10 of them are like, well, we've already done that, and that's what got us into this mess. <laughs> right? right? We did that. But basically, Jesus is commanding them, go and act as if you're cured. Go and act as if you're healed. Act as if something has taken place in your life that has not yet happened. And so they have heard enough about Jesus. Life is terrible enough. Whatever it might be, a mixture of the two, they think, well, it can't hurt. And so they turn and they depart. And Luke tells us that as they departed, they happened to be made clean. So they're going down, and all of a sudden, their skin is made clean. And one of them, realizing that he had been healed, came back. Only one. And it says that he praised God out loud, prostrated at Jesus' feet, and thanked him. In that moment, I love it. He's headed down, realizes, look at us, look at what's going on, turns around, goes back to Jesus. And then we get this little statement in Luke. Incidentally, he was a Samaritan. So we kind of get an interesting story here. So we have 10. The assumption is one out of the 10 is a Samaritan, right? So again, in pain, in the margins, that ethnic boundary of Samaritan and Jew didn't matter. They needed one another. But now all of a sudden there's this healing and all of a sudden he finds himself on his way to Jerusalem, probably with nine others. And the question becomes, what did he realize that the others didn't? 
he realized something. Like, surely the other ones saw that they had been healed. But the text says that he realized that he had been healed. And I think he's traveling down, and all of a sudden he heals, and he's now with these folks, and he's going, where do I go? My whole ancestry has told me I'm supposed to go to Mount Gerizim to worship God, to that priest, to show that priest what's going on in my life. But here I am on this journey now to Jerusalem. Do I go to Jerusalem? Do I go to Mount Gerizim? And here's what I think he realized. Like in that moment that was different than everybody else, I think he realized, hey, wait a second. This is all nonsense. (laughs) Hey, hold on. Like, whether I go to Gerizim or whether I go to Jerusalem, those are the systems that put me out in the margins. They didn't offer me healing. They only offered me exclusion. They only offered me a label. They only told me I couldn't come back until... They only told me there was sin that caused me sickness. Like, so now I'm going back. Like, maybe there's benefit to doing that. But I think what he realized was that Jesus was actually the center of his healing. <laughs> that it had nothing to do with either the temple in Jerusalem or the temple on Mount Gerizim. It was Jesus. And here's what's fascinating. In the moment that he realizes Jesus is at the center of his healing, what does he do? He promptly disobeys Jesus. (laughs) Right? He promptly is like, I'm not not following that Jesus who tells me to not to go to the priest. He disobeys Jesus. Isn't that frightening? Right? I mean, let's just follow the Bible. (laughs) Let's just follow that. But here's the thing. Like, I think there's, there's beauty in this great metaphor that sometimes people tell us to do things and they say, Jesus says you're supposed to do it and maybe we should disobey that. That's kind of take a little bit of that. That's a side free note for you. But he, he does. He disobeys Jesus. But what does his disobedience to Jesus do? It brings him to Jesus. Right? So he turns around and he's doing two things. He's praising God And he's thanking Jesus. Because here's the thing about the Samaritan. This Samaritan does not think of Jesus as God. Promise you that. There's no possible way. He would have never understood Jesus as God. He would have thought of Jesus as a a, a prophet. He would have thought of Jesus as a healer. He would have thought of Jesus as very close to God, that God is working through Jesus. But he would never have thought, oh, that's God. I need to go and now I worship God and I'm going to come up with a creed and say Jesus is very God of very God. You know, that's not, that doesn't come across, it's, it's not part of his vernacular. He wouldn't ever be able to do that. And I think there's a way for us to recognize we can praise God and thank people <laughs> and see them intertwined. Because that's what I think the Samaritan is experiencing. And so he comes back to Jesus because he knows that the center of God's work in that moment wasn't Samaria or Jerusalem. It was in Jesus. It wasn't that Samaria, the Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem or Mount Zion didn't offer anything good, but he just knew the center of what God was up to in his life in that moment was this man, Jesus, and that's where he wanted to be. So he comes back, he falls in worship, and Jesus says to him, 10 were cured, weren't they? But what, what, what became of the other nine? Didn't any of other them, anybody return to praise God besides this foreigner? Well, what happened to the other nine? And the foreigner's like, well, they obeyed you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, is the sun getting to you, Jesus? <laughs> now, here's what's so powerful. What, what we're finding here in this story, and I want to unpack this, is that the foreigner found a new place to worship. The foreigner found a new place to worship, and it was at the feet of Jesus. It wasn't at the feet of the priests. It wasn't at the religious structures that were arguing with one another. Not that we know anything about religions arguing with each other today. That's so foreign to us. It's hard to imagine. But this foreigner, now this foreigner is a huge word. So Luke uses this word, and we have a fancy word for this. It's called a hapox, but it means it's never used any place else in the New Testament. No place else does this word occur. It occurs one time right here, the word for foreigner. So there's, a, there's the significance that this is probably a very intentional word. We don't find it really outside of Jewish literature. It's, it's a very technical word that Luke uses here. And what this word is, it, it's the very word that comes from a very famous inscription that would have been found at a few places along the balustrade of the temple. Now, the balustrade of the temple was like an ornate railing that separated the space where foreigners were allowed to go, and then you went into the court of the Jewish women, 
and then you went into the court of the Jewish men, and then you went into the Holy of Holies. So the, the very temple itself had this exclusionary reality to it. And so there was this ornate kind of fence, it wasn't a fence, we'll just call it a fence, that, that separated what was called the court of the Gentiles or the foreigners from where Jewish people could go. And all along this, there were these monuments that were placed. And they said, with the same word, elogenes is the word, it says to foreigners. And it said in Hebrew, in Latin, in Greek, and it forbade access to any foreigner, any elogenes, under penalty of death beyond this point. So this is what it said. And I think we actually have a picture of it here. If you want to see, like, we actually have these stones. Like, archaeology has found these from this period. And it was etched into the stone all along the balustrade. And this is what it said. No foreigner, the same word that Luke uses. So when Jesus says, is the foreigner the only one who's come back? It's it's the same word. Like no foreigner, nobody like this guy. Nobody like this guy can enter within the balustrade, around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught on himself, shall he put blame for the death which will ensue. In other words, it's his own fault. And he receives a death penalty. He's done it to himself. And we actually have other texts that, that seem to portray historically that Rome gave Jews the authority to actually, uh, it, it, to actually go about the death penalty should that happen. They, it was legal for them to do that. And so Luke is helping us understand like something amazing is happening in Jesus. And that's why it's important that we recognize like the stories of Jesus in the Gospels are theology. Their theology, their help, their, their, the significance, the meaning, what is it all about? And it's about this moment where Jesus says, so wait a second, the people that are allowed past the signs, they ignored where God was working, but the one who's not allowed in could understand. There's a secret of the kingdom that's found in there. And so he says to this foreigner, this one who's not allowed inside the temple, get up, be on your way, your trust has cured you. Your trust has cured you. You might have heard this translated at times, your faith has made you whole or your faith has saved you. I actually like this translation very well because nowhere in this context is there really any need. When we think of the word save, we we go off into weird places. But he says, this trust that you have in coming back to me and not going to the temple, like that's cured you. And here's what's fascinating. 10 men were healed that day, but only one was cured. Only one was cured. Church world, we use the word saved sometimes, which just begs the question, saved from what? Which we don't have time to go into that, so we'll just go with cured, (laughs) because that makes sense in the text. And we kind of know this too. You know this. You might not think about it, but you can be healed and not cured. You can, right? So this happens all the time in our finances. So think about financially. Financially, you have found healing at times, but not a cure, because this is what it looks like. You find yourself, you overspend a little bit. Anybody ever spend more than you have? I'll wait. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> kind of a shared company. We, we have a tendency, we'll spend more. Than, we end up carrying a little balance. That balance gets bigger, right? And all of a sudden, we're like, oh, man, I'm in debt. And I can't really afford it. And I, and I feel like I'm being held back. I can't. But then something happens for whatever reason. I don't know how. You save up or, you know, you, you get a little bonus at work or, or you get a new job and you're able to pay off that debt that was like hanging over your head. So you found healing, but what happens in six months? <laughs> like if you're laughing, you kind of get it. In six months, you're right back where you were. Like there's another little debt. There's another big debt somewhere. So what happens? You found the healing, but not the cure, right? We found the healing in the moment, but we didn't find the cure for overspending. This happens relationally too. If you're in a string of relationships and they're all kind of bad, <laughs> right? You find healing from one relationship. You say, this is unhealthy. I've got to get out of here. So you end it. But then what happens in like a month or two months, you find yourself back in another relationship that's unhealthy. So you found healing from the one relationship, but no cure for the loneliness, no cure for the codependency, no cure for whatever it is that's, that's continually bringing this up. So this happens in our lives. And it's interesting that in this moment, Jesus makes this very clear statement. Your trust, your faith, your trust that I can do what the temple can't do has, has cured you. It's cured you of something much bigger than your leprosy. It's cured you of an exclusionary system. It's cured you of a whole way of seeing and understanding God. And interesting, between Luke and Acts, this phrase happens four times. Your faith has cured you, or your trust has cured you, your faith has saved you. And it's always done with four people 
who have, it's usually, it's, it has some sort of physical ailment that's excluded them, three out of the four, and there's always an initiative on the person's part. Like, the person always takes the initiative. The person comes in faith believing that Jesus can do what their religion can or what their culture can't. There's always an action on their part that initiates things, right? So there's the story of what's called the sinful woman who comes and anoints Jesus' feet. And then Jesus says to her, like, everybody's going to you know, know about this. And, and, and all of a sudden, there's this like, moment of your faith has cured you. Like, we don't know that she had any physical ailment there. We just know that culture had rejected her because of her life. And then there's the woman who's healed from the hemorrhage, if you're familiar with that story, who reaches out and touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And, and in that moment, all of a sudden, we have Jesus saying, finding her in the crowd and saying, your faith is that she reached out. Then we have another man healed from blindness who says, Lord, I want to see. Like, reaches out, calls for, cries out. And then we have the leper who comes back and worships. In each case, there's this initiation, there's this moment, which I think is where like a lot of really wonderful like traditions within church world come from. There's, the, there's that raise of the hand kind of moment. Are you going through something difficult? There's the acknowledgement that I am, and it's this kind of reaching towards Jesus. Some faith traditions, they, they invite people to come forward to, to pray, to step out of their seats in faith. And it's not magic. It's just this kind of sense of like, I'm physically bringing my whole self to the table, those can become manipulative and highly problematic, but where that comes from is this idea that there's something powerful when we kind of have a faith movement towards Jesus. And so this idea of cure, of being saved, I think is about coming to a space that I can acknowledge that it's the presence of Jesus where the work of God takes place. And that great, beautiful mystery still carries on today, 2,000 years later, that that the promise of Jesus was for those who believe, those who gather, I'm right there in their midst in some mysterious way. And that's where the work of God is. That's where the heart of God is. That's where peace of God. And it's not to say that the religion itself doesn't offer wonderful, good things. It's just to say that it's not enough. And there's something that supersedes. There's something greater than the temple. There's something greater than religion. And this is Luke's agenda. Make no mistake about it. And the reason why we know is because the next two verses, remember I told you I was going to give you a bonus two? So that's happening right now, so lean in, right? Verse 20 and 21. Now here's why you should know that like this is definite theology in the crafting of a story, because Jesus is in the in-between lands, and then all of a sudden he's having a conversation with Pharisees. <laughs> like where did they come from? Right? We just kind of read it and we don't like think about it, but like Jesus is in the middle of between Samaria and Jerusalem when Luke tells this incident. There's, there's, there's lepers nearby, which I'm telling you, they're not going to be Pharisees where there are leper, lepers nearby. And so in all of this, like the very next thing, like this man is healed, right? It just says, when asked by the Pharisees, <laughs> like, where did they come from? When asked by the Pharisees when God's imperial rule will show up or when was the kingdom of God going to come, this is what he says. He says, you won't be able to observe the coming of God's imperial rule. You won't be able to see the kingdom of God. People aren't going to be able to say, oh, here it is in Jerusalem, or over there it is in Samaria, right? He says, you're not going to say here it is or over there. And, and you just have to read that within the context of Mount Gerizim or Jerusalem. On the contrary, he says, God's imperial rule is right there in your presence. It's right there. It's where Jesus is. And this man recognized it and showed gratitude, and so he experienced it in that moment. So here's the thing. This is what I don't want us to miss. We experience God's presence in our gratitude for God's work. You want to find the presence of God? Just start offering gratitude. Start offering praise. And I don't believe that this means <laughs> in every moment, like you just start being thankful to God. I'm just so grateful, God, that you, you, you caused me to lose my job. I'm just so grateful that that person stole all that money from me. I just was worrying so much about all my money. Now I don't have to worry about it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for the death that has come into my family. I just believe that, that, that heaven needed another angel. I, that is not what this is saying. And I think that's why Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit in his letter uh, to the Thessalonians, right? This is our anchor verse for this series. 
Paul, this is the earliest document we have in the New Testament, by the way. One of Everybody believes this is clearly, authentically Paul, a guy who lived 2,000 years ago. We still have this letter, right? This is the radical Paul. He says, in all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So to be in Christ Jesus, which is a huge phrase for Paul, to be in Christ is to recognize that in every circumstance, I offer gratitude and I give thanks. Not for every circumstance, but in every circumstance. Why? Because it brings healing. It brings the cure. And so that's what we want to talk about over the next three weeks in all these circumstances. And today we want to focus on the present. I want to encourage you in your everyday, normal, peacemaking life to make it a goal to express gratitude for how God is working in your present circumstances. So whatever your present circumstance is, to say one of the things that I need to do as a peacemaker, as a follower of Jesus, is to recognize what God is doing, not in the past or the future, we're going to get to there, but right now in my life, where is God at work right now in my life, that I can say thank you. It could be something simple, right? It doesn't have to be, but what would that be? That's kind of, we have the pumpkins and the tags today. Like, what is it that I'm grateful for? And to help us get a good example of that, uh, every week we're going to just have a conversation with one of uh, our new council members. So we have a whole bunch of new council members. We're going to introduce three to everybody in case you don't know them. And so today you're going to get to hear uh, from one of our new council members, Steve Boston, as we ask this question, how and in what ways are you grateful for God working in your presence? So do me a favor. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. That, was, that hero video was just long enough to get the chairs. It was just long enough. We planned it like that. That's right. I'm out of a lot of breath, though. Me no. too. I had to walk up here. I know. That microphone is heavier than people think. So, Steve, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, what you're up to these days in your everyday normal life. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Steve Boston. You probably know that by now. But let's see. Um, historically, I was a Army officer for about 29 years. Uh, currently, what I'm doing is I'm still a consultant for the Department of Defense. And when I'm not doing that, I'm a substitute teacher here in the Thompson School District. So, and then I have a whole lot of other, other jobs, volunteer jobs. I work with the community kitchen with Sally. Um, I work with the Lago Vista Neighbor Ministry with Sandy. I saw you over here somewhere. There she is. Um, and what else? I'm on the church council, and I work with the students. So I see a lot of the students over here, some of the parents and kids out here. And what else do I do? Well, you've got a real heart for yeah. kids and students. Yeah. And in that video we saw, most of the time you're surrounded by them. Yeah, I don't... I, I don't know why I can't get rid of them. I'm like <laughs> a it. child magnet. Love it. Um, so one thing I just wanted to ask is, when did, when did faith in Jesus really become a grounding point in your life? I don't like to ask the question of like, oh, how did you find Jesus? Because I just, I, I think that God, Jesus are always present with us. And then there, there does come a point in time where we kind of start to believe what's true of us. We have, start to have that faith to believe that we're loved that we're whole, that God is at work, that God has called all of us, right? So what did that look like for you in your life? Yeah, for me it was, I was brought up in a Christian household, uh, and so I was pretty much always a believer, but I was not always a follower. And so what happened is uh, life got challenging. Mm. You know, here I was, I was a full-time Army officer, I had two elementary school kids and a wife, and so I'm trying to work full-time and trying to take care of the kids because my wife was sick and she was in and out of psychiatric hospitals uh, and, and we had been going through that for years and I just was literally exhausted. And, uh, and one day I remembered the, I remember this song that we sang in 10th uh, grade choir uh, called I Heard the Voice of Jesus. And, and in that song is this verse, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where it says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Mm. 
And I remembered that song, and I thought, that's me. Mm. I'm weary, and I'm, I feel like I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I knew at that point, mm. I knew I could go to Jesus, and I would get the rest I needed. He would take the weight off my mm. shoulders, and everything would be okay. And so I became a believer in my 30s, not just a believer, but I became a follower mm. in my 30s after having to deal with that challenge, uh, you know, that life challenge. Yeah. Oftentimes it's, it is those antagonisms that give room for, like, the diamonds of our lives to emerge, right? Like the tensions there. It's how, Absolutely. how we find out. That's great. So one of the things we're, what we are talking about today is the power of gratitude, and then we're kind of the that like application, like how we bring it into our lives is to, to look at our current, current scenarios and to ask the question like, what am I grateful for right now? Like, what am I grateful for? And so as you think about that in your present life and your kind of reality, tell us a little bit about your present and how you're, you know, experiencing the presence of God in your gratitude. So, you know, I spend all this time working with kids and what I've come to realize is that they trust me to speak into their lives. And so I'm very thankful for that. It's, it's one of those things where they don't have to trust me, but for some reason they do, and, and that allows me to feel the presence of God. You know, when I see their acceptance, when I see their trust, I literally feel, I feel God's pleasure with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was talking to Jim the bass player this morning about this, the same thing with the music. You know, I used to be a worship leader a long time ago. And I would come out on the stage in front of the church and I would feel God's pleasure with what I was doing. I get that same feeling mm -hmm. when I work with kids. I get the same feeling when I work with the men that I, I co-lead with Dennis Anderson on Saturday mornings. I get it when I work with kids, you know, the young adults that I run into in the, in the community. My, I have a a young lady that I've adopted as a daughter at Poor House Restaurant. And so every Sunday afternoon, I go and have lunch there, and I check in with her and say, hey, how's everything going? You know, how's your mother? How are your, your boyfriend and your sisters and brethren? And I can feel the presence of God and his joy as I do that. You, you, you said something interesting um, that you sensed that these, you were thankful for the fact that these kids trusted you, and you, you, you experienced God in that. And on Thursday night, you said it was almost as if you were experiencing God trusting you in that same space. Unpack that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I, I, when, I, when I feel their trust, to me, that is an extension of God's trust. And it's, it's God saying to me, you know, you're not perfect, but you're out there and you're working for me, mm -hmm. and I trust you to do something for my kingdom, mm. you're, you're, you come every day, you show up, you give your time, you give your talent, you give mm. your treasure, you don't have much of any of it, but you bring what mm. you have to the table every day, yeah. and I am showing you my trust through the people that you work with. Mm. That's good. So, you get the last word. What would you, how would you encourage everybody who's tuning in, sitting in the room, to find the presence of God in gratitude for the present moment. I, I think, you know, when I wake up every morning, I wake up with an attitude of thankfulness. And so with that attitude, what I've learned is that I actually find something during the day that I'm thankful for. If I wake up with the intention of being thankful, I find something to be thankful for. And that, I think, is the, probably one of the best ways to start your day. That's awesome. Hey, do me a favor, everybody. Give Steve a great big hand. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. You leave it right there. Steve will be signing autographs for anybody that signs up to ring bells. So uh, you got to sign up and then he'll sign autographs. So, so we're going to receive communion in just a moment. And this whole series, we're going to have this feast together of like gratitude for what God has done for us through Jesus. Uh, in his death and resurrection and what these symbols represent. Um, but I do think it's important that we recognize gratitude does make us better. <laughs> and it does make the world around us better because there's a couple of things that happen. Like gratitude brings us to a space where we can find a cure even when we don't experience healing. Even when we can't experience healing, 
when we walk through grief, right, and we, we can't ever experience a healing of that loss, right? Gratitude in some way helps us attach ourselves to the cure for death, which is life in Christ, right? And that doesn't mean that it isn't difficult. That doesn't mean that it, there isn't doubt. That doesn't, that's one of the crazy, like, to be grateful does not mean that I don't doubt God's work or God's presence at times. That's all a part of the journey, But to lean into gratitude presents the opportunity to be at the feet of Jesus, to be in this space of the cure for the fracturing, the cure for the the antagonisms in our world that are always going to be there. This is the great, like, there is no ending of the antagonisms because the antagonisms oftentimes are where we find our greatest truth. It's where we find our greatest experience. It's why that call to worship said, what we have right now is the real. (laughs) It's this present moment, all of it. So not only can we find a cure without a healing, something else really powerful happens, and that is that gratitude connects us to one another. That when this leper shows back up to Jesus, he connects himself to Jesus because he's recognized that Jesus has brought goodness into his life. Jesus has brought a healing into his life. And so when we can have the courage (laughs) to express our gratitude towards people, maybe even people we don't agree with, that we don't find of the same tribe, that we are in we argue with, uh, and we would be on different political sides, we'd be on different economics, whatever it might be. But we can actually pause and recognize that person has expressed God to me. They brought love into my life. They've, they've brought joy. They've challenged me. They've shaped me. They're, this is where God is at work. Now I'm connected. And in our world right now, more than ever, I think for us to experience the glory of God, for us to experience the presence of God, is to learn how to, to be connected with people that aren't like us to be connected with people that believe differently than we do. And that is the great scandal of (laughs) this moment. And the great scandal of the cross is that we are all connected. So I want to invite you to stand up. And as we receive communion, ask yourself this question, like what is it that God's inviting me into this week? What is God inviting me into today? So we're going to have stations around the room where you can pick up uh, the communion elements today. And then you can, here's what we're going to do today. Last week we held them all and we ate and drank together. I want to encourage you during this song to open up that communion and just have it as you want to. If you're sitting with your family at a table, maybe you want to huddle together and pray together, right? If you're sitting in a, in a row together, you as a family might want to pray together. If you're here by yourself, you might want to just sit quietly and reflect on thankfulness and gratitude. And then when you're ready to take the bread and the cup, As a reminder, we practice open communion here. There is no class to take. There's no paper to sign. There's no doctrine to believe in. This is a moment where where I want every person to know how much God believes in you. And this is a moment where we willingly accept the scandal of the cross that I am no more special than anybody else on this planet. That that's the whole point. The whole point is the body of Christ is broken for the world that the world would come to believe that it is enough, that it is whole, that it is true, that every person would, that we would all understand that. And so the body of Christ that's broken for you and the blood of Christ that's shed for you, these symbols that represent a demonstration of God's love for the whole world. So as we sing this song, these, these elements are here. It's a disposable cup. And so I would encourage you to peel off the bread first, you know, if you want to do that, that's a good one first, and then to open up the other side. Otherwise, it might get a little messy for you, all right? And remember, when you want to, take the bread and the juice on your own. I'll come back when we're done with the song. Pray for us together. Give our blessing for the week.